When you can give the gift of knowledge, you've provided someone with something that is immaterial and therefore will last them forever. Good ideas, things that nourish the mind, that's powerful. Peace to the saints. Today's topic is the science of joy and happiness. The reason I say science is because human beings are fairly predictable creatures, which means that if you are to have joy or happiness on a consistent basis, this is something we can actually plan out and make sure that we've provided for it instead of hoping it shows up. And so few of us are consistently happy, right? Let's be real. You go into a restaurant and you notice your waiter or waitress is unpleasant. Well, that's because they're unhappy with themselves, not with you, but they're taking it out on everybody. It's a shame. I was just recently reviewing some notes from a book that I read some time ago, in fact, in my early 20s. And the book is entitled Joy, Expanding Human Awareness. And it's a book by William C. Schutz, published in 67. And it's a part of the human potential movement. And in my early 20s, I was very much so invested in the idea of what can I achieve? I was an ambitious young man wanting to do much and build a fortune having come from the mud. So, of course, a guy like me was very much so interested in human potential. Schutz describes man, that is humankind, as a biological, so, uh, psychological, and social being whose joy arises from those sources. What does he mean by that? Man is a biological being, which is to say if the physical apparatus is not strong and healthy, you will lack joy. We know this on a scientific level. When you exercise, you feel endorphins. These positive neurotransmitters make you feel better, which is why within the SAS, when we say start your day with exercise, exercise is prayer. And if you remember at patreon.com slash the saint in the center, I just posted up my exercise routine, three different routines that I do and switch off on. One of them is our the rest day, which is actually not a no workout day. It's a lighter workout. Yiddy, we go hard out here. Now, he says, humankind or man is a psychological animal, which is to say you have to understand your own psychology, your own mind, and be able to influence yourself. So often we talk about influencing everyone else, but can you influence yourself to wake up early? Can you influence yourself to get things done when you don't quite feel like it? Can you influence yourself to be disciplined? If you fail to exercise influence over the self, not only will you be unhappy, you will also be underachieving. Lastly, he describes the human being as a social animal. And this is critically important for you lonely folks out there, which is to say that as an individual, you must still be part of a community, which is why I know many of us are thankful for the assassin, which is like a haven for geniuses and creative people. But you cannot be alone unto yourself feeling unsupported without family, without friends, because a human being cannot maintain happiness under those conditions. No man is an island. Okay, we have Tommy Bali sent a super chat. He said, peace to the saints. Marquette, lately I am suffering from depression. The only people that seem to care about me is my family. Also, I feel like I've never had a good friend. Any advice? Well, this is a perfect talk for you, Tommy, and I'm glad that you were brave enough to express your emotions. Uh, I think many people go in and out of various levels of depression. Hopefully you're not slipping into clinical depression. I trust that's not the case. When you say the only folks who seem to care about you are, he says family, right? Yep. Well, that's understandable for family ties are generally you know, more so unconditional. But let me challenge you to care about yourself, which is to understand that in actual fact, the person who should care about you most is you. And I have an upcoming video that I'm going to do actually live, and it's about the importance of being self-interested. Some might wrongly identify this as selfishness or narcissism, but it's the idea that you are rooting for yourself. You're your number one cheerleader. And when you're talking about others not being invested in your mental well-being or your happiness, well, that's understandable because the truth is most people are selfish. But the question is, are you using intelligent self-interest to make sure that you are cared for? And I want you to pay attention to a lot of the notes that we identify in this particular lecture because it'll give you some clues on how you can maintain your own happiness. But 
if you've read my book, The Black Box, it talks about friends, family, strangers, and how at the end of the day, you know, they're all lovely people and some of them may not be good people, but what you can always rely on is yourself because you will always be there with you, right? When it's late at night and you're in bed, it might just be you. When you wake up in the morning, it's just you. If you get injured and you're in the hospital, at some point you'll be there alone. So if you can't learn to get along with yourself, and I don't know what's happening with the audio here, sorry about that, thanks. If you're not able to get along with yourself, be happy being alone, then you're going to have a lot of troubles. And this generally happens, A, when you don't have a goal. And when you don't have a goal, you never feel like you're progressing. You feel like you're standing still, as though everyone and everything is passing you by. And so there's this cycle that I just recently described with one of the saints to one of the saints on a consultation because he was feeling similar feelings to yourself. And the idea is that the, the man goes through this cycle. One, you have a goal. And to pursue your goal, you must start actually from a place of rest and happiness, which is to say rest, meaning you have enough energy to start pursuing your goal and happiness, meaning you have the positive feelings that drive your action, right? You're more happy. People are more productive. So you start from a place of rest, and happiness and enjoyment. Then you move on to the stage of work, meaning you're toiling or gliding toward your goal. If you're fortunate enough to achieve your goal, if you're an ambitious person, you might forget and just establish a new goal, but what you should really do is go to the next step of celebration. This is something where you include people in recognizing you for your achievement and your works. And this is the cycle that human beings should continue to go on as they move upward in life. And this provides for enduring happiness if you're engaging the cycle correctly. Often we find a breakdown when we achieve a goal and we forget to celebrate, we go on to another goal, which means we're engaging in endless work with no reward, no celebration. So we find ourselves to be exhausted. Then when we're exhausted, instead of engaging in things that rejuvenate and re-energize us, we engage in numbing activities like watching Netflix, watching a show that makes us laugh, but doesn't inspire us, doesn't drive us to action. So those are the challenges with being mindful of where you are within this cycle of male development and male achievement, I should say, male achievement. I love that this book is so clear and fairly simple. Now, obviously these are my notes, so they're even more clear and simple, but we often forget that you have to be a part of something. You know, in years of yore, we were a part of tribes, you know, real communities where we share a language, we share a religion, we share values, belief system, and we mostly would look the same or within the same ethnicity and racial category. And now in the modern world, we're so spread apart. We have different values. We live in apartments or tenements right next to people in close proximity. We've never met them, don't know their name, and don't even trust them. And so the feeling of inclusion in this modern world, especially with social media, well, those feelings are missing. We don't feel included. In fact, we feel isolated and we try to approximate inc inclusion by things like social media and, you know, sharing memes and sending videos to your friends when in reality, friendship occurs in person. Secondly, this one I really like because we forget about this. Schutz theorizes that man requires control. And this is something that men have various levels of depending on their income, their job, their family position, and their societal standing. But we all require some level of control, especially as the male human. And sometimes you'll find that you go into a particular business and someone who is essentially powerless is trying to exert a level of control that they actually don't have. And that's the human drive to feel powerful or empowered. And people who might not be experiencing that in their home life or experiencing that in any area of life, they try to exert control in the wrong setting or context and it causes them pain and both the other person they're trying to exert control over pain. But the truth is we must all have some level of control. Ideally, at the very least, we should be able to have control over ourselves and our own affairs, which is why I teach capitalism and entrepreneurship, because when you have control over your own source of income, you know, that is one of the greatest forms of empowerment for anyone. Lastly, he talks about affection. And, you know, don't we all know that this is absolutely critical and the lack of affection 
uh, particularly from the individuals you want affection from, be it familial or romantic, causes much turmoil. And we know that much of what you would call the manosphere or MGTOW, these particularly particular entities have arisen from the lack of affection that many males are experiencing in this society. In fact, these movements, so to speak, are actually the result of complaint, right? It's complaints of not getting the affection that the human being seeks and they're organizing together mostly to commiserate rather than to be productive. But it just points to the fact that this is a critical human need, especially for the male. Inclusion refers to, according to Schutz, inclusion refers to man achieving balance between being with others and being with oneself. I like that Schutz talks about balance because most human beings are imbalanced in some way. When we're talking about inclusion, some people can't stand to be alone with themselves. They call themselves extroverts as though that means they should never be alone. And so they're always calling up people, always want to be out at the club, always want to be doing something among others. And when they come home and they're alone, they feel down or depressed or there's a lack of energy. And that's primarily because they're not spiritual at any level. We must be spiritually developed. And that's something that we're going to start talking a lot more about within the Sassin. In the society today, people have trouble disagreeing respectfully. And I'll actually be addressing that in the book that I'm writing right now, which is entitled Near Future. It'll be a very entertaining, humorous, and controversial read. I trust that it will be one of the most controversial books released in the last half century. Control means that one has a reasonable amount of control over the happenings and the trajectory of their life. I find this to be a fascinating description in as much as he is describing a reasonable amount of control, not total control, for human beings don't have total control. That would be godly if God exists, right? So one thing that I find spiritual or religious people, true believers are better at is accepting what they can control, that which is within their locus of control, that is their reach, and being comfortable with that which is beyond their control and accepting that we do live in a world that is somehow chaotic, in a world where there are things that are circumstance and we just have to take it as it comes, make the best of it, and try to thrive. When you can give the gift of knowledge, um, you've provided someone with something that is immaterial and therefore will last them forever. Good ideas, you know, things that nourish the mind, that's powerful. Whereas most often we're giving people things that are perishable like flowers or things that are material, i.e. temporary, or things that are detrimental like alcohol. Shots for everybody, right? So, peace to the saints. And for those of you who want the audio book, uh, I think it's about eight hours. Um, it's probably one of the most expensive audio books out there, and that's because it took me so long for me to make it. And I also want you to read the book first. Audio books are great, but reading is like prayer, as is exercise. So you can get the audio book at thesassin.com slash, I think shop. So if you go to assassin.com and click shop or you go to the description, you'll, you'll find the audio book as well. We have John Waynes in a super chat. He said, just coming into the chat, thanks for all your insight. What is the name of the book you are referencing? You're actually talking about uh, right here. The book that I'm talking about right now, which I don't recommend you buy because these notes that I'm giving you are pretty much all that's relevant in the book. It's entitled Joy, Expanding Human Awareness. This is a book by Peter Schutz. And these are my notes that I wrote when I was in my early 20s. And reading is important, but what's more important than reading is action. You know, when you get the knowledge and you actually do something with it. Uh, most often people are concerned with brainstorming and ideas, but they never get to work. Carrying on. Joy is what we feel when we can acknowledge that we are and all of the expenses, experiences which have shaped our way of being and all of our habits and traits without feeling shame or guilt. I'm gonna repeat that. Joy is what we feel when we can acknowledge all that we are. So he's basically saying, do not engage in self-denial. Love all of who you are. 
That goes straight back to our three sentence Bible, our three sentence Quran, our three sentence Torah. Number one, be yourself. Number two, be good to yourself. He is saying, love all that you are. This is one of the things that is most absent in our society today. A woman just recently had DM me and asked me, hey, what would you think of me getting a, a lip filler? I've looked at this woman's face many times. I've never crossed my mind that she should have any work done. She's a pretty good looking woman. And surely I hadn't looked at her lips and thought anything about them. But the fact that one would look in the mirror and be so viciously self-critical, trying to impress who, right? I don't know. But we're in a society where we think we're not good enough, when in fact, often we are. So having accurate self-perception is good, but accepting all that we are is even better. None of us are perfect, for that is the nature of being a human being, and you will be much more happy when you accept who you are. And that's why so often individuals in this sick society are quick to call others narcissists when they find that others are satisfied with themselves. And that's because they are jealous of the fact that you are content, you have peace, and they don't. Joy is what we feel when we can acknowledge all that we are and all of the experiences which have shaped our way of being, which is to say that, yes, in part, you are the result of your genetics and another part, you are also the result of your experiences, all of which are relevant and build up to who you are. And in my book, The Black Box, I describe a professor I had at Berkeley. And there's a situation in which he was feeling inferior. He was among other professors at this elite institution and he tried to make it sound like he had studied at Harvard to get his PhD when in actual fact it was Howard and HBCU, a historically black university, which is less prestigious. But he tried to make it sound like he had studied at Harvard. He was not honoring the experiences that had shaped him. And in doing that, you're hiding. And in hiding, you're living in fear. And in experiencing fear, you surely cannot be happy at the same time as you are fearful. He writes, acknowledging all of our habits and traits without feeling shame or guilt. Now, this is something that we have to be critical of today because this is a shameless society. We say, oh, don't fat shame, as though being fat is not shameful, it's disgusting. We say, don't uh, slut shame, as though being promiscuous is an admirable quality. It's actually a quality that leads to death and destruction. So shame and guilt are important, but what I believe Schutz is pointing to is the idea that you should not be ashamed or guilty about who you really are. You should be real about who you really are, your merits and your shortcomings. Schutz continues, well, these are my notes, so I continue. Happiness cannot coexist with fear. And often on my consultations, once I peel back the layers with someone, whatever situation they're describing, whether it's a relationship, you know, romance, it's a familial situation, it's a business situation, often we peel back the layers and find that fear is at the root. And I always ask them, what would you do if you weren't scared? What would you do if you were a millionaire? What, were you, what would you do if you weren't worried? Which is to say, when you're a healthy, happy human being and you're not, you know, trying to dodge an unfortunate possibility, what would you do? So what I'm saying is be brave, be fearless, go forward like a fearless lunatic. And in doing that, you get the best outcome, but you'll also be happy. He writes, happiness cannot coexist with fear, fear of punishment, fear of failure, fear of success, fear of retribution, it all must go. I like, and, and I wrote this obviously, but fear of success. Do you realize some people are scared of being successful? This is paradoxical, but they're scared of being successful because when you don't believe that you are worth anything, you don't have self-worth, you don't think that you're an important person or you're destined to have good things, you will have fear of success. You will self-sabotage to make sure that you don't get the promotion. You will self-sabotage and let people overlook you for a promotion. You will fail to talk to that woman who's right there next to you because you don't think you're good enough when in actual fact you could have had her but you have fear of success.